Um, we started off with the offline panel. Now we're moving into a, to a networked world, you know, where we're connected to a network, even though obviously we discussed a lot of uh, network connected stuff in the earlier session. I'm going to introduce the panel very quickly. Um, from the end, we have uh, Ilya Grigoric from Google. Um, if any of you who have sort of been to Velocity or um, have seen uh, Ilya present, he's going to give us a little opening talk for 10 minutes just to uh, set the scene. Um, so he shares an office with Steve Souders, I think. There you go. Um, and next to him, we have uh, Andy Davies. Um, he's a local boy, so we're from Bristol. I don't know, where are you from originally, Andy? Wales, Wales, I'm Welsh. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, um, you know, um, yeah, he's, he's from Wales. Uh, occasionally they win a rugby game, but not Luton. Um, next to him, we have um, uh, John Cleveley from the BBC. He was uh, responsible for migrating BBC News to a dynamic platform, be building features mobile first, using responsive design all the way up to the desktop. Yeah, I think, I think Andrew wrote that piece of, uh, piece of thing. And last but not least, we have, uh, we have Jackson. Jackson's presented at our London Web Performance User Group and, and Velocity and stuff like that. He's described here as a veteran troublemaker at Facebook London. I think it's supposed to be troubleshooter at Facebook London. No, it, troublemaker. Okay. Uh, works on tools and mobile, help build mobile timeline and app center. Saying you had anything to do with timeline is extremely brave. Um, cool. So basically, we're just going to kick off with uh, Ilya giving us some opening remarks. Working. No? Yes. That one not. Just use the. All right. Walk? This one works. Do you want to walk and talk? Uh, that works. Now, what's the magic trick to get this thing there? We wave to the nice man. Okay. Hello. <laughs> waiting, waiting. Waiting. No? Waiting. Waiting. I see. <laughs> ah, warming up. Tell a joke. All right. Well, no, no jokes here. Um, it's all serious <laughs> stuff. It's all network performance. <laughs> the crowd looks lovely. You guys look great today. No, but um, right. But seriously, I, I'm not going to take ten minutes. I don't think there is. Uh, it's far more interesting to talk about um, on the panel. Uh, to answer, there's a lot of good questions in a moderator as well. So, I'm just going to kick off with a couple of. Let me see. Wrong screen. Uh, that that is weird. Can you guys see that? Sort of. All right, there we go. Um, so one, one thing that, I, uh, that I've discovered as I've been working on network performance stuff is I've been becoming kind of grumpier and grumpier in the sense that you know, people keep asking like, hey, we should uh, put more stuff on pages. I want to put more images, more video. I'm like, no, 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 don't, don't do that because that hurts performance. Everything you do hurts performance. So like, the fewer things you put on your page, the better. So uh, because of that, I've started actually migrating my like, HTML presentations to like, bash just to illustrate the point that like, Go as low level as you can. So this is actually running in Chrome via SSH, but in Bash. So it's awesome. Anyway, moving on. So a lot of the network stuff is like not the sexy stuff, right? Like we can talk about all the awesome things that we're building, all the new CSS animations, and then you start talking about performance. It's like, yeah, that TCP thing. Ugh. Um, so a few things. I have like four high-level things that I want to uh, kind of seed maybe the discussion a little bit. Um, cache primitives. So we heard a lot about caching and offline, and I'm really excited for the stuff that's happening in, in the offline panel. I think that's, that's a big, big um, improvement. Uh, it'll obviously take some time to get there. The local storage stuff is really interesting. You know, I'll, I'll just um, add maybe one more comment to the earlier discussion. Um, I don't think it's a solved problem. The, the fact that it's a sync or async API, I think, is maybe a slightly wrong question to ask, uh, because for example, if you look at local storage performance on Windows, it's actually really good. Why is that? Uh, because they have Superfetch, which is like a, a platform feature within Windows, which preloads all the data independent of the app. So this is not an IE feature. Like IE doesn't have these latency delays that Chrome does. In fact, Chrome is like the worst performer um, in local storage. It's something that we got to fix. So. Um, I don't think it's as simple as we may maybe make it out to be. Just having an async API doesn't necessarily solve the problems. So I think there's an 80% solution even for something like local storage. Um, the fact that this new uh, 
controller script is actually interacting with the, uh, with the browser's cache, I think is awesome, right? Un unlike the previous versions, which kind of it's either all or nothing, and you don't kind of have a fallback. So I think this is all uh, great stuff. But moving on, um, something that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about and uh, fighting with is user agent sniffing. Um, I think we can all agree that this thing is just dead, right? Like, we all have to use it. It's unfortunate. It sucks. You have to pay for these databases. You have to get it on your serving path. It is disaster no matter which way you look at it. And not only that, but it doesn't actually give you the answers that you're looking for, uh, which is kind of like the, the best uh, combination of all those things. So I do have a proposal out there. Um, we actually have a, a prototype that's in progress in Chrome for this thing called Client Hints, which is like the, the world's dumbest idea, which is if you're looking for DPI, why don't we just send it to you um, in an in a HTTP request header? That's really all it boils down to. So if, you, if you're curious, take a look. I'd love to get your feedback. But I think this would actually help quite a bit uh, with a lot of problems in the um, responsive design uh, world. And speaking of responsive design, you know, if you talk about network performance and web pages, 60% of all the bytes that we ship today are images, which is huge. So if, if nothing else, right, if, if there's one area we can like focus on and fix and improve, it seems like images would be it. And unfortunately, if you look at what's happened in the kind of image space, um, nothing has happened, right? Like we have PNG, JPEG, and GIF, and that's it. And it's, it's not obvious why we don't have another, you know, 10 formats. I don't know if 10 is needed, but at least another couple, right? Like we have WebP that we've proposed on, on, on at Google, and WebP gives you a lot of improvements, but I don't think Web, WebP is the end all. I, I'd, I'd hope to see more image formats, and it's not obvious why we're just stuck with these three. Um, then you look at the products like Opera Turbo, Silk, PageSpeed, right? Opera Turbo is an incredibly popular browser in, in a lot of countries where bandwidth is uh, at a premium. And like 90% of all of the improvements that all of these proxies get is they just re-encode all the images with WebP. Like that's literally all they do, just blindly transcode everything to WebP. So that alone is like, well, what, why don't we do that for the rest of all the pages? So, you know, we could like decrease the size of our pages by 50% by just re-encoding all the images, uh, which seems like a pretty nice thing. And speaking of re-encoding images, well, one thing that I realized, you know, I've, I've done a lot of um, uh, studies now uh, looking at WordPress sites and a whole, other, whole uh, number of other content. Uh, it turns out we as humans suck at picking image formats. We are either lazy, uh, we are either too busy, uh, we pick the wrong formats. So uh, we save things as PNGs, which should be JPEGs, we save things as JPEGs, which should be PNGs. Uh, it's just a disaster, right? And there's a lot of actually image optimization solutions out there that exist that you actually can pay for, which will say like, hey, we'll optimize your images. If you give us a PNG, we'll like strip the metadata and all the rest. It's like, cool, you're gonna strip 100 bytes out of my, uh, you know, 150 kilobyte image. I'm like, that's still a win, uh, but the truth is like, you should have been saving that as a JPEG, which would have been a 15K file, right? And we're not doing those trans that transcoding because it's much harder. Um, and that's, I, th I think that's this is something that we need to fix. And this problem only gets much, much harder when we look at the responsive uh, area, where now you have different breakpoints, you have different device, uh, device widths. Uh, I recently ran a study for, uh, looking at um, how frequently do we rescale images on the client or downscale images on the client. And it turns out that uh, about 20% of all the large images are getting downscaled on the client. So we're shipping extra bytes, which is getting compressed, like this is just wasted, wasted bandwidth. So we need, I think we need server, server help. We need a client side solution, which we don't have today. We need a lot of, there's a lot of room for uh, better server uh, integration to help us uh, with this problem. Because it only gets worse, right? You have five different viewports. You have high DPI, non-high DPI. Now you have 10 variants. Um, add some art direction use cases and now you're like, here's your, you started with an image tag, which was beautiful, one line, and then you look at your picture tag and it's like 40 lines, and you're like, I am not writing that, I'm sorry. At least that's, that's for me. Um, another crowd favorite, uh, NetInfo API. So let me just <laughs> talk about this one for a second. So bandwidth estimation, you know, should, whoa. Uh, should we have bandwidth estimation in the browser? And the answer is uh, no. 
ever. Yes, right. So why why is that? Right, it's worth actually thinking about it. And and usually uh, there's a good counter argument to that as well. We have that right. That's uh, we have that for video, and the insight there is what when we do do ad um, server adaptation for video. But the way that works is we stream you a five to second chunk of video, then we see how you downloaded it, and then we kind of adjust. All right. So it's adaptive streaming, not predictive streaming. If you look at the actual uh, bandwidth throughput, especially in mobile, your mobile carrier can adjust your bandwidth on one millisecond gr uh, granularity. Me moving a phone from like here on my desk to here can double or take my bandwidth by half, right? Like the, there's such high amounts of variability that we can predict bandwidth or we have stable bandwidth on the order of milliseconds, maybe at most second. It's completely unpredictable, anything beyond that. So you sending uh, a request for a GIF file, right? And then fetching that and saying like, ooh, one megabit per second, and then making a decision is completely useless. So you know, maybe if we switch all of our internet back to circuit switch networks, then we can have this conversation. But I don't think that's going to happen. And then the last one, which I think is something that we haven't actually talked about, is um, radio and mobile. So mobile is obviously a big, big topic for networking. And uh, battery life is something that I don't think we as web developers have actually thought about at all. Battery life is actually, turns out, very important for native apps because people rank these apps. You know, you run this thing and your battery's dead and you're like, this app sucks. For web pages, we haven't thought about it. But in reality, um, they are just as costly, right? I can point you to pages where uh, if you sit there reading your news, for example, on some sites which are using real-time analytics, sending 10, uh, 10, yeah, every five seconds they send like a, a, a real-time beacon for a real-time analytics app, you're just draining your battery. Like it's killing uh, your battery. The radio is the second most expensive thing you have in your phone in terms of power. The first one is the screen. The second one is uh, is the radio. And they're actually about the same, like the same order of magnitude. So turning off your radio is incredibly important. Um, there's like big, big anti-patterns, uh, stuff like inefficiency of periodic transfers. And I think this one's really um, illustrative because even if you look at the um, Android docs, right, when we, like two years ago, when we started building these native apps, we said, hey, fetch just the stuff that you need. And then, you know, as the user needs it, you know, fetch the rest of the content, thinking that you, know, you don't have enough bandwidth and you should get the best experience up and then kind of progressively fill in. If you look at the docs now, they tell you completely the opposite. They tell you, download everything, like burst everything you can as fast as you can and then turn off the radio and please, please, please don't turn it on like ever again. So I don't think that message has reached the web developer community. And it's actually pretty interesting to think, um, I don't think we have an answer for how exactly do we surface battery and network performance? Can, what, what's that trade-off? Like we, we don't have an intuition in the browser for what is the cost of a page. I'd love to see a metric that says like you've drained X amount of your battery by visiting this page. That'd be kind of cool. Um, and then the last one is 4G won't save you. Um, I see a lot of conversations about this, which is like, I heard LTE is going to fix all things. Um, I'm just going to wait for that. You know, se seems reasonable. Uh, and it seems reasonable when you're here, like you're in you know, downtown London and you probably have really good coverage. The problem is when you actually look at what the carriers are saying, they're saying, look, we've invested a lot of money into 3G and 2G networks. We have a lot of users on older hardware that can't migrate to 4G overnight. 3G and 2G networks will continue to exist for at least another decade, at least another decade and you will have to build apps that will transition between 4G, 3G, and 2G, right? And that's just the reality of it. And you, have to you can't design your apps with just targeting 4G. So those are the high level points. That, that's all I got, and I think we'll go into the panel. and come out from behind the panel a bit and so I can actually see them instead of talking to them. Make sure you talk to them, don't talk to me. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Okay. So the first question we actually have, the highest rank question on the list is, should we have continuous live feedback access to the user's network speed similar to Navigator.Battery? And the answer is, 
No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You'd think we rehearsed that. Awesome. Right, okay. There are actually a few a few questions that were about about that topic. Um, some people obviously hadn't heard of Net API. Some people some people had. I don't even think it was worth really answering any of those asking any of those other questions. Just can say no. Can we take a step back though? So okay. I don't think so. We can't have bandwidth estimation. I can't tell you you have two megabits per second or three megabits per second. It is useful to know which type of network you're on, which is kind of the level of granularity that you should be working at. It's like Knowing that you're on Wi-Fi tells you certain things about, for example, the latency characteristics of your connection. Right? You're not going to have a weird transition state where you have to wait for two seconds before you actually get any packets on the wire. If you're on 4G, you have like pretty tight bounds on latency again. Knowing on 3G, so basically it gives you goal posts. Right? Like here's what the minimum, here's what the maximum is. And that's about the level that we need to operate. So the net info spec actually had this, the early revisions. It was, it was specifically said Wi-Fi, 2G, 3G, 4G. I think we need to revert this back, like 15 iterations, go back and implement that. But also, like, if you, when I'm at home in Suffolk, in the middle of the country, my Wi-Fi, I get about a meg. And I come into London with my phone, and I get about the same, even better sometimes. So it's like, you've got to use the information quite wisely in yes. terms of not making yeah. too many assumptions. But the latency thing, definitely, right. is definitely going to help make decisions between 3G wireless and Wi-Fi. And there's always the, the one like the dog sort of sitting up uh, on the 4G where you get intermittent one bar connection. Like, that's not as good as a 3G connection. But yeah, so like, even then, it's still a problem. Like, it's not, like I said, it's goalposts. It's not granular, like, immediately useful data. But the original spec got dumped for privacy reasons, didn't it? I think the privacy reason is completely bogus. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just put that to rest. What, one other factor. Could it tell you that the guy is roaming, he's moving? Use the mic, please. Uh, so the question, the question from Derry was, could, could the spec just at least tell you whether the person is actually moving, like if you're in a moving car and a moving train, which has an impact on your, certainly on 3G anyway? I guess you can enable GPS and look at the coordinates <laughs> if they're changing. But no, hold on. But I think there's two different things. Roaming and moving well, you are two different moving, things. You mean, I meant moving, but roaming yeah. and moving. Yes, he, he meant motion as opposed to being paying 25 US dollars a megabyte for Verizon in Gibraltar type roaming. Uh -huh, yeah. um, that would probably also be useful. So I don't think that's a concern of net info, right? So if you are on the move, for example, 4G performance is much, much better than 3G performance mm -hmm. if you are moving. I don't think that's something that net info would surface. So well, one question for me is, is from me is that if NetInfo is giving you an API that you're, you have to query in your JavaScript and then you send that message back. Why is the browser not sending that message to the server side in a, in a header or an unsolicited cookie? So from the point of view before I've even served the request, I've got an idea of what the connection type is. Well, that comes as part of um, Ilya's um, client hints spec, which <coughs> is also running into the same privacy concerns from some people. Um, so the idea that whenever somebody makes a request to your server, you expose their screen size or how they're connected, you know, gives, starts to give you ways of actually fingerprinting browsers, and we can do it pretty well anyway. So there are some privacy concerns about it. So once again, privacy stuff completely bogus because you can just look at your. No, 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 like. Who do you work for again? So if you have the IP address of your visitor, you can do a reverse map to say, hey, you're on T-Mobile. And you're, you're coming from the subnet, so you're probably on 3G network. That is what the CDNs are doing today. This is, this is all the information that we're exposing. So I, th I think this, th this actually doesn't hold much water, this argument. Okay. I, I actually don't think the privacy issue has been the main killing issue of, of these features. Uh, the, with the sending it additional headers, uh, the problem is there are billions of requests happening every day right now, right? If you add even like, 20 bytes of data into each request, we're talking about gigabytes and gigabytes of data being sent for absolutely no reason in the in the like the 99.999% of cases. So that, that's the main product of adding initial Mike, please. I, I agree with that. I think, I think the crux of the issue is less the network connection you're on, sort of the information that you can glean about the network, more the device that you're sending to. That's the thing that I think when you're try, trying to get the biggest ones you can out of the network request. 
knowing what the device can handle ahead of time is, uh, is pretty, pretty key. And I think sending an each request is not the right way, but it goes back to what you said before about user, user agent sniffing. Knowing concretely on the server side what to send is also a really, really hard problem. But I feel like that's the trick. Like that's the sort of the magic bullet in a lot of cases to get good purpose. Say, these are the things I know I don't need to send down. Um, and in the sort of the media query world, you send everything. Like you send it all for the layout, send it all for the, the JavaScript. In reality, you don't need to do that. Like a load device, you just don't need to send stuff. And in some cases, you don't even have JavaScript in the devices. You definitely don't need JavaScript resources. But there's not a I don't know, there's no surefire way. I'm curious though about user agent sniffing because I know what we do. I'm curious what, what other folks do for that. Everybody does. You have to. Yeah. So, oh, no, I mean, concrete, like, but you don't like to talk about it. I, I have one. <coughs> uh, about. Yes, thanks. <laughs> 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 Introduce me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I had a comment about, about the spec and about the previous version of the spec. I think. There was an argument about privacy, but another thing was that many people was, were claiming that the type of network is really not enough information. It's not, it's, it's not telling you enough about uh, the type of connection. You might be in a conference like this on a Wi-Fi that is completely cluttered and you don't get any throughput, right? Or uh, you might be actually on, yeah, on... on, on yeah. Yeah. And, and we have the problem that we have with the net info is that we're trying to find a way to make, to, to get this information without defeating the purpose, right? Like the header problem or measuring bandwidth. You have to measure so, it changes so quickly and you have to measure so often that you're going to be draining uh, the battery. You're going to be defeating the purpose entirely. So that's, and that, that's a very hard problem to solve. I would be happy to go back to, to the connect, connection type, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a matter of, there are many use cases, there are different use cases, and we have to yeah, so see which ones are more important. Some sort of notion of a connection quality. And, and I don't know how to define it exactly, right? But it's, it's kind of that like losing your Wi-Fi signal. You have just enough to be connected, but not enough to do anything else. Uh, that is a good example, or you keep timing out. Uh, but that needs to be surfaced by the operating system somehow. Uh, this is not, I don't think the browser should be the one trying to claim this. Sorry, I work in a browser. Um, I work occasionally on Chrome for Android, and we've been talking quite a lot about this particular issue and this particular API. And the, the thing we've come to understand as it relates to the last session is What's up with the, mic, guys? the only thing that we've come to understand here is that the, the, the thing we've come to understand here is that the only meaningful uh, data point is the point at which you're actually requesting a resource. That is the only time when you can make any sort of a decision that's worth a damn about whether or not you've got good quality. Because anything else is opening up a window which your expectations might be violated in. So if I go and I ping occasionally to a server, now I've got a window um, in which I'm going to make assumptions about the quality of the connection, and I'm likely to be uh, unfortunately shocked and surprised by the, the terrible things that happen in the interim. So um, you know, tying this to an actual request, I think, is the only way to do it. And we don't have any other API right now that does that. I don't even know that that's really the crux of it, though. I feel like the answer is just to, to think about your application from the standpoint of minimizing your risky network time and also uh, taking as many steps as you can to harden your application against it. So, um, you know, not putting all of your eggs in one uh, chunk, chunk HTTP request, you know, make, bring it up over multiple H HTTP connections when necessary. Taking those, <coughs> those steps, so to me, like arguing about whether or not we should or should detect uh, network connectivity state is like arguing about, you know, the, the whether or not the sky should be red, color, or blue. Like, we're not going to know. It's not going to be good enough information. So what are the things that we do that are reasonable to sort of uh, to get around that, to, to make the application decent uh, in spite of that? But that's, the, that's the part of this discussion that I think is interesting. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I actually, yeah, I was going to say, John, I mean, you've got practical example with the BBC, you know, apps. What are you guys doing and do you care and how are you dealing with that issue? Yeah, we care a lot about uh, making sure that our site works really well on low bandwidth. We have a lot of um, our users use a world service sites. Um, so we basically are almost really anal about file size, looking at HTTP, HTTP requests. And going back to the working out what connection you're on, um, I'm kind of interested in what people actually will, will use it for. Because um, you can imagine users going to the site on broadband and then going on 4G on the phone and getting completely different user experience. I'm kind of interested in what, 
what differences are we going to actually be able to do if you've been detected at higher, higher bandwidth? And obviously you've got video and images of the big things. Um, but the way we kind of um, look up, make, we're kind of being really efficient with our file sizes, basically. And as you said before, like images is the big, mm. is the big thing. Um, so even though we haven't got responsive images uh, as any sort of standard, um, basically we're using JavaScript to work out what's the container size, and then we've got a number of recipes on the server producing a number of different image sizes, and we grab a, an appropriate image for that particular device. Right. Did you do that in, uh, in real time? Like, how do you generate the special resources? The, I mean, the, uh, the different versions of the images. So, they're, yeah, they're generated the first time, then cached on the server, and then onto CDN. But in the, in the generated case, I mean, I'm sure you've got multiple, multiple resolutions. Do you require yeah. the people who are publishing the stories to Upload separate resolutions, or you? No, so they'll um, create a, a one raw image because they're journalists um, rather than actual users with Facebook. So that might be a little bit different. So we can make sure the journalists are uploading the biggest size we can, um, and then we've got 20, say, different image sizes that we would select so, from. So you transcode all of that effectively server side for the. Exactly. Yeah, so we would it's resize it. Process that's doing that rescan. Exactly. It's just a URL that we hit and it will do it on runtime. Do you do any of the art direction stuff? Sorry? Do you do any of the art direction transformations on the image, or do you just crop them? No, it's resized? literally just resized, no. yeah. So, somebody said that the connection quality would have to come from the OS, but I think it can come from the browser. One thing we do when we're uh, monitoring a website is keep a track on the time to first byte for each host we're talking to, and if we see that go up, we fire off a network test. So the browser itself could track and say, hey, this is my average time to first byte from Facebook.com, and then you could respond to that. But your time to first byte in mobile networks will vary dramatically uh, because you have the different radio state transitions. So for example, on, on 3G, it can be anywhere from 200 milliseconds to two seconds, just because so you're radio you usage. Do you give your standard deviation or min-max? No, no, but this is just your first packet. This is your yeah. first packet. After that, you're pretty good. It's 100 milliseconds. Or less, 50 no, milliseconds. You keep, you keep measuring that. So, yeah, this is just no, no, but, but the point is, then you, then you wait, then, then you wait five seconds, mm -hmm. and then you will once again incur two seconds. I think the fundamental problem that we have is we have this mental model of Wi-Fi networks or mobile networks being the same as wired networks, which is fundamentally wrong, right? And it, because of that, we feel like there's all this variability, all of this randomness, um, on all of this latency. But once you actually understand why these delays are there and you design for them, like hey, I know I'm on 3G network right now. Every once in a while, I'm going to dispatch a request which will first block for up to two seconds. right? And this may not be a problem if it's just like a, a background update thing, because who cares? But if this is a, an interactive you know, user clicking on something and you're on 3G, that's a UX pattern that you should be aware of, because you probably need a different feedback loop in your app to say, hey, this could take a while. So you're saying you'd have a different user experience with, depending on what sort of network you're on? Well, Always. I'm just saying you should design. You should design with this in mind. Like yeah. you will, if you're on 3G, if you're on 4G, even some actions. Like if if my phone has been idle for a while, the first network interaction that you're going to have will have a delay, anywhere from 100 milliseconds to two seconds, before any packets get dispatched. So, so going from like the mobile first approach, do you think we should use that? Behavior is like the standard for everybody in terms of That's making probably sure. Probably a reasonable thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, just one comment, Rigo. I'm basically my own firm. Um, just one comment regarding the measurement of uh, time to first byte with resource timing, especially if we could add byte size into resource timing, we could measure continuously. Um, the bandwidth throughout the download, that the end-to-end -end bandwidth uh, throughout the download, which is, I mean, it's extremely complicated to measure the, the bandwidth between the, the various resources, but we can have uh, a fuller picture of uh, the download. Uh, Great, times. we're going to have a fuller wrong picture. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna move on from this topic because I think we've we've done it to death. You either believe that measuring the bandwidth is useful for you, or you may believe that the measuring the bandwidth is a complete and utter waste of time. I think it really comes down to if you're, you know, sort of more for, more for John's point. Question really is, 
you know, why do you, why do you want to know and what are you going to do with that information? You're not going to be switching between four different kind of viewport things of this application or, you know, ways of displaying this application on a millisecond basis, you know, who really cares? So, Chris, one quick point. that like if the screen is bigger my, my connection is faster which is not really true so that's one problem we need to fix also the retina displays and these kind of things i can be on a slow connection with my retina display machine i still don't want the two meg background image yeah so the question is in flash we had adaptive screening of videos and why don't we get this in the html5 world what do we need to do to get this because right now i want people to stop using flash for that kind of stuff Sure, yeah, that's a good comparison. I, I guess, for me, like, the... Can you repeat the essence of the comment for the mics? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can hear that, but it's a comment. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so the reason was, uh, not every device is sort of on the same caliber. Oh, I'm sorry, device screen size is no proxy for network activity. Uh, and it, that's the sort of measure that we take against, uh, like, what stack resources and what images we send across. Uh, you, you mentioned the flashback video sort of that video, where, where you can get a lower quality video in a lower bandwidth environment. You need something with all these lines for, uh, for the HTML. Basically, you, know, basically like you get the... Well, whatever. You get the lower quality image in a low bandwidth case, sort of magically by the... Uh, the so sorry, by some technology that does it that we don't have currently. Is that the yeah. essence? Yeah. I forgot what I was going to say about it. <laughs> 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 and the answer is yes. We need that. Sorry. So I want to get on. There are some other questions on other topics that I want to cover and get away from Net API. So one of the questions which you started to talk about with you had different versions and optimized stuff. There's a couple of questions in here that are basically around, you know, uh, should I be should I be compressing? Should I be using minification? You know, what things should I be doing during my build cycle in order to? Um, you know, well, I mean, I'd have the question. You know, it does, does minification really save you all that much when it's going to be gzip compressed anyway? How yeah. many people here? How, how, how many people here? How many people here have a build script for the project they work on? Have a build script for the project they work on. Holy shit! Oh, wow. Yeah. That's like pretty much everybody. Awesome. Nice. I had no idea. This is awesome. And how many? And, and, and how many of those build scripts include performance optimizations? Oh, now you're just showing off. That was about. <laughs> that was about everybody again. So so so. So people, you know, so who's doing minification? Who's yeah? Who's doing image optimization and resize on the fly? Not, oh, about, about a tenth of the people who answered the previous question. What else would you like to see? Well, it's, it's, it's a question for the panel. What, what else can people do in their build cycle you know, that you think that was gonna really going to help their delivery, particularly over low, high latency, low bandwidth networks? I think the other thing you can do is, you know, you can, for, for JavaScript, you can pile everything into an all.js. But you, get, you do get to the point where it starts to get massive. Um, and so there are, if there are other pages where actually it's a specific bit of behavior that you can kind of have in a different package, then sometimes it's good to kind of work out what you can split out. Um, and so on the majority of pages, you're still using this all.js. But on these other ones that you, know, you can get away with splitting things out. Uh, so we use AMD to kind of do that kind of stuff. And there's probably all sorts of different dependency type things that you can use. Um, so it's not always about making one massive file. Um, so sometimes you need to be a little bit clever about how you split stuff up and bundle stuff. I agree with that. So the, the approach we take uh, for Facebook is that there's sort of there's two levels. There's uh, basically all of the important interactions that, that matter, like clicking on links, uh, loading things by uh, uh, XHR, and then there's all the rich features, all the really bulky, all that JS stuff. And so in the header of the page, before the body, uh, we'll call it the primitive JS. We'll send out all of the the basics, the really tight, do not put bytes here, you're wasting human lifetime sort of stuff in that, in that uh, snippet of JavaScript. And then the stuff you need later, you'll get to it. Like eventually you'll get those, those features, you know, the widgets, the flyouts, the, uh, the, uh, the beavers on the side, the, the core interactions that are JavaScript enhanced, they'll be there immediately. It's yeah. the exact same approach. And it's just downloading what the user's actually going to use as well, and like using feature detection. You know, <laughs> so if you're doing video, check that the user can actually play video before you download your HTML5 player and things like that. Um, so just looking after the guys with the bad phones, because they've obviously <coughs> probably got bad JavaScript as well, on, probably on slow connections. I'm making lots of assumptions here. Um, but you generally get the idea. Um, basically, it's just progressive enhancement. That's kind of the most basic level. But there are also a lot of people who are afraid of 
in particularly in the design community, of, of server-side stuff. If you look at um, media queries, the showcase site for responsive designs, and you look at the configuration of some of these guys' servers, they, you know, there's basic things like gzip compression missing, keep alive missing, cache directives missing. There's a lot of basic stuff that, as a web industry, we're really bad at doing. Yeah, it's actually surprising. Uh, maybe not in this room. I think in this room, most of, most of us here have the basics right. Turns out most of the rest of the industry still has the basics wrong. Uh, that, that's a big problem. As I say, I'm, a, I'm an ops manager. I'm going to disagree with that. Just because all the developers in this room are doing everything right, sure as heck doesn't mean the ops guys who run the servers are doing it. All right, fair enough. Um, I'll, I'll come back. So we talked about JavaScript. Um, I'll come back to images. 60% of the bytes, images. Um, you're, you probably have your uh, PNG, Optim, JPEG, Tran, or something built into your build script, chances are you're still missing the opportunity to transcode it to a better image format. I'm guessing half of your PNGs are better encoded as JPEGs and vice versa. This is a much harder problem to solve because it's likely that your PNG is hard coded into your app, which means you need to rewrite your code. But this is a huge, huge opportunity that you should look at uh, today. And you guys have a server-side solution to do the image resizing. I think this is something that more and more and more people need to deploy. Because we just stick images into a markup and resize them on a client. And that's a big problem. And it's a hard problem. It's sort of uh, exponential nature. Because you, if you want to serve every single resolution, well, that's a different image size. You know, if you want to fill with full with uh, image for every single resolution, like that's a massive number of resolutions. Yep. Uh, and so the coping mechanism we use is to um, basically we're into four-ish categories. I think we have roughly four uh, size groups, like very, very small, you know, like uh, original iPhone, high-end sort of iPhone world, and then like gigantic uh, tablet-y, uh, very high-resolution Android phone-y stuff. Uh, and then use uh, careful CSS to let it crop on the client in a way that's like reasonable. And that way you, you know, you never quite get uh, exactly the right thing in all cases, but you end up having to have not a massive amount of server-side storage. Yeah, this is Jonas speaking from Mozilla. Um, one, one thing we saw when we were looking into doing WebP was that um, it, the, the reason it wasn't convincing was we saw that people could just use better JP compressors. Uh, like you could, th there's so many, like when you're encoding to JPEG, use, if you just use better parameters to your JP compressor, you can actually win about the same order of magnitude as, as the, these 30% that WebP uh, currently propose. And, it, and it's, it's quite possible that WebP, WebP can do even better. But like the order, the, the wins that, that people were shooting for could be had in many cases with just passing better parameters to your compressor. So, OK, so I think there's a couple of threads in there. You have quality level, right? And most, most of the time today, we save our JPEGs either as 100, or if you're like advanced, you'll save it as an 85. We can go way down into the tail and actually get very good visual performance at a fraction of the cost. Uh, WebP does have about 30% on average better compression at the same quality level, or at the same perceptual level. It is definitely the case that you can take all your JPEGs, save it at lower quality, basically recompress them, and get much better uh, just bytes on the wire. So that, that is definitely true. And I think that's an underappreciated area generally today. I think as well is trying to work out from a UX perspective how many images you need to show. Like you know, we can fiddle around with compression, but actually, you know, if you if you can cut down if you if you go to the desktop BBC News site, we've got a lot of images. And so that's kind of what something we're kind of looking at to work you know on our mobile site, we've only got ten. Um, and that's just a massive win. And so it's working out, just trying to do less, but do the stuff you do do really well. I think that, that's the biggest thing for network stuff. On the feature phone, you drop the images altogether on the news page, don't you? Yeah, that's right. So if you hit the, um, our site on the feature phone, like in Nokia, you'd literally just get the first, mm. first image, and that gets replaced out with a better quality image if you're on a wider screen. And then we um, postload all the other images 
with JavaScript. Yeah, quick question. Uh, Colt McCandless from Google. So can we actually talk about how the fact that the smaller image compression formats we have increases or decreases our network hit, but actually increases our runtime hit? So all those JPEGs and PNGs have to be decoded to full resolution 32-bit and then transferred to the GPU, which actually puts more pressure on the GPU memory, causing more invalidations, and actually hurts your runtime performance. What are our thoughts on fixing this? So that's a, I don't think there's a fix for it. It's a trade-off, right? Uh, it's quite like, how does WebP give you better image compression, right? Well, we have more advanced algorithms that take more CPU time. And vice versa, you need, to, you need more time to decode it. So th this is an interesting trade-off. Like, it will take more time to decode a WebP image than it does to decode a JPEG image. Um, and you need to look at, maybe if you were building a game and it's like you have a ton of image assets, right, maybe that, maybe your CPU, especially like an, on an ARM processor, is your limiting factor. Uh, maybe at that point you make a decision to use something else. Uh, we recently did some studies, I don't think we've published anything yet at this point, but I think we will. Um, we looked at image search um, at Google where we moved everything to WebP and just looked at like what are the wins, what are the losses. We do take more time in the CPU, we take a lot less time on the network. And the net trade-off is we're still better off using WebP in that specific case, right? And this is your image search page, which has like 20 or 30 images um, at different resolutions. So th this is, this is I think, a great point. This is something you need to keep in mind. OK. I think we've done images to death. We've got about 10 minutes left. I want to try to move on to uh, kind of two semi-related topics that are very network specific. Um, the first is um, some guy named Andy Davies from Bristol asked the question, with the adoption of multiplexed protocols like Speedy and HTTP2 and the prioritization of resource downloads by the browser um, uh, based upon the type, will data URIs, data URIs become an anti-pattern? That's kind of one question. Uh, and then there was another question that was basically about um, sort of about web sockets and stuff like that. So I kind of just want to move on to talking about those. So does anybody want to ans answer Andy's question other than Andy? Or you can answer your own question if you want to, Andy. I, don't know, I think it, it echoes what you said earlier, that the idea that uh, the best request is no request. So data URIs are pretty sweet for that. Like you, it's all there. It's like one, uh, you, you know, if you're building a mobile app, you can put all of your data URLs in your CSS and your, you have one CSS file. Like that's, that's when I think. I don't know. It, I can't imagine a world where going from no request to any request is a, a better trade-off. <coughs> there are, there so why do we inline stuff? <laughs> it's because we have limitations in HTTP 1.1, which mm. make re small requests expensive. It's the same reason we sprite images. It's the same reason we concatenate files, all of the stuff. With Speedy and HTTP 2, uh, that goes away, because we can multiplex all the stuff in parallel. You can send all of your requests at the same time. We don't need multiple parallel connections, yada, 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 right? Then coming back to inlining. Inlining is a form of a server push where you say, like, I know, so here's the idea. In HTTP2, we have this proposal to say, sometimes the server actually knows what you're going to request before you request it. Like, I'm sending you the damn page. I know the resources on it, so why don't I just send you the resources? It seems kind of obvious, right? So that's the idea behind server push. With push and, and inlining is push, because you're saying, look, I know you're going to ask for this icon, so just, like, here, base64 in the file, forget it, right? Like, don't make the request. That's a trade-off of HTTP 1.1. With 2, we can actually get away from that and say, by the way, here's the file, and why is that a win? So let's say you have that small icon or a big icon or whatnot, and you inline into a page. Now you're inlining that thing into every single page if it's on multiple pages. So you're just bloating the, uh, the size of each page. Whereas with push, it can actually be in your cache. So I think it is mostly an anti-pattern. I'm sure there's one or two uh, use cases where uh, there may still, like, if, if it's only used on one page, yeah. it's effectively the same. Um, there's another question here which is about WebSockets. It seems that abstractions like Socket.io and Pusher are the preferred way to use WebSockets. Is this a failing in the specification process? Is it now the expectation that new DOM APIs will be needed to be wrapped by libraries or frameworks? So basically saying is the specification sucks so bad you've got to use a layer on top to make it work. <laughs> we'll take that as a no. So, I mean, who's, who's using, I mean, apart from the guy from Pusher in the audience, who's kind of using WebSockets and are you using WebSockets in a mobile device? Can I see a quick show of hands? So that's about 
four or five people, maybe. Does anybody sort of have any really bad problems that in, in a mobile world that they think that that causes? Uh, so they said that they, one reply there was because the network providers blocking WebSockets traffic. Okay. So this is, this, I think, there's just repeat, two, repeat the answer. Um, so the question was, or the comment, is that what sometimes uh, website connections just drop out on mobile networks. And this is a deployment problem. So I think there's two problems. First of all, WebSockets did go through a very elaborate process of many revisions and specifications. Uh, depending on which server you use, so I happen to have worked on one, it's in the Ruby implementation, the EM WebSocket. If you actually look at the implementation, we have like, 15 implementations of all the drafts. It's, it's a total nightmare, right? In terms of negotiating, oh, this browser supports this spec, et cetera. Um, that was problem number one. So I think we did fail in the specification process of that specific standard. The bigger problem today with WebSockets is uh, you have to deploy it over SSL. If you're deploying it on mobile, you have to deploy it over SSL uh, because all of the carriers or most of the carriers have some proxies in between that try to optimize traffic, whatever that means, right? And they look at WebSockets and they're like, look, this doesn't smell like HTTP, close. Or even better, the blind proxies, which don't even care what's in there, they're just like substituting bytes, right? And this is why without SSL, 20% of your connections on desktop will fail randomly, right? You have a proxy that doesn't understand WebSockets, and end of story. On, it, on mobile, it just happens to be the other way around. 80% of your connections will fail. So if you want, you can reliably deploy WebSockets today. It's HTTPS. And that's how anybody on mobile deploys that at scale. Right. Isn't the, uh, do you want to say Musola again? Isn't the big reason for library use that a lot of browsers still don't support WebSockets or a lot of browsers that people use still don't support WebSockets? Which we sure. can't really get away from. So yeah, we need HTTP fallbacks for browsers that don't support it, and you know, hence the reason for Socket IO and all of these other abstractions. And that's just an unfortunate reality of you know, not everybody's able to upgrade to an evergreen browser. Some people are just stuck on an old IE machine that they can't upgrade, and you know, I I don't know how to fix that. I sort of <coughs> so, got a question right there. Yes. Uh, Hi, my name is Makoto uh, from New Bambi. Uh, is if I use a WebSocket from mobile, does it mean like a draining battery further, or as long as it's like a, a idle connection, it doesn't uh, drain? Uh, yes no. and no. It depends on how you use uh, your WebSocket. If you're sending periodic messages, like every five seconds, you'll keep your radio active all the time. Um, I think what a lot of people confuse about is you can have so your radio can be off, but the TCP connection is still alive. Right? I think a lot of people confuse this. They, they think that the, the, ra the moment my radio turns off, I've lost my WebSocket connection. That is not the case. Your actual TCP connection is still maintained by the carrier, and it's just the radio link that, that goes missing. So I guess the best practice for uh, WebSocket traffic on mobile is send as few requests or messages as possible. Or if you do, just, just as with regular traffic, send it in bursts. So just, just, just on that, there were quite a few questions on the list about, you know, radio stuff. I think Ibi had kind of covered it in his introduction. Um, Hello. Yeah, so I'm um, Phil. So I think just the, just there were a few questions there about battery use and this kind of stuff. I think Ilya covered it in his, in his introduction that you've got to be aware of it. Just one question for me as a rule of thumb. Where, do we have any idea of how quickly the radios turn off? Like, is it once every five seconds or once every ten seconds? If I want to beacon analytics stuff back, if I, what's, what's a rule it's of thumb? Carrier it's carrier dependent. It's carrier dependent. Yep. Yeah. But it's slower than that. They say that for much longer than anything. It's also a minute, isn't it? I mean, I know that if you, uh, we, we get yelled at by some carriers saying that we basically had out one of our uh, log data delivery um, uh, services was just underneath the radio time. So we were always just. Keeping it away over and over again. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a much uh, 
you have uh, a longer wait, well, the, the radio will, wait, will stay awake longer than you think it would. Yeah, so it's network configured, and uh, there, there's a great case study paper published by AT&T. Three minutes. Later. Three minutes. Um, at and I don't remember the name of it. If you just search for at and radio performance, I think you'll find it. They have the Pandora case study. Pandora app, you play the song, they did the right thing. They downloaded the whole mm -hmm. song up front, so they streamed the whole thing, they turn off the radio, and then every 60 seconds they would send a beacon, uh, which is just a, a measurement beacon. And they measured it and they figured out that those beacons accounted for 0.2% of the traffic and 40% of the battery use. Right, they eliminated that, they doubled their battery performance. Okay, yeah, um, just a few points. I'm Phil Legator from Pusher, so obviously we use WebPlocket. So I handle most of our support. So I just wanted to back up that, you know, SSL connections, um, when you're using WebSockets, yeah, definite. Um, in terms of the WebSockets dropping, I think that's because most of the browsers don't implement ping pong uh, from the specification. So we've added that as our kind of protocol layer. So, I mean, we are sending messages when, you know, maybe we shouldn't have to but obviously th there would be a message natively from the browser. So again, you know, if, if you're using um, WebSockets in a browser, have a ping pong timeout. Um, yeah, and we, we haven't had a lot of problems with that. We, we've obviously got HTTP fallback as well because we need it, but. With regards to radio power state, so is it, would it be worth for the developer to have a means to tell the browser this request and send it only whenever you have the radio in full power. If the if the if it's an idle state, don't wake it up just to send this because it's not urgent. I mean, this is something so I would like to see personally in, in military style microburst, basically. But uh, and I mean, avoiding excessive sig signal in traffic, which is uh, what happens when you switch radio states. It's uh, it's in the best interest of everyone not to uh, clutter mobile networks. Yeah, because we do loads. <laughs> so the, the answer is yes, and this is actually something that we discussed at the W3C performance uh, group uh, meeting that we had back in November. Uh, there's this new proposal that I, we're going to start working on in, I think, around May of this year. It's kind of our timeline, called the Beacon API. And the idea being that it's exactly that, right? Like, I want to send a request, like an analytics request, that I don't need to dispatch right now. Dispatch it anytime you want. Even if you, in fact, even if you lose it, like maybe it's not the end of the world, but just don't wake up my battery, right? So it's, it's almost like the, the async keyword on like an XHR to say, sometime, make this happen. Okay, that's basically, uh, that's basically the time up for the, uh, for the network panel. So I'd like to thank uh, Jackson, John, Andy, and Ilya.